and welcome to another episode of the Mystic Discoveries podcast. I'm your host Amanda and today I'm talking to the awesome Paul Weston. Paul wrote a book called The Occult Battle of Britain which is awesome and I encourage you to go and download it before or after you listen to this podcast. It's such a good read. You can buy it on Amazon um, for Kindle. Um, The main reason I wanted to talk to Paul was that I it was a bit selfish, really. I just wanted to learn more about Dion Fortune, um, which a lot of you probably are aware of. I don't know, well, I didn't know that much about her before I started researching for this podcast. I just feel like she's a really important figure in the occult esoteric history of the world, you know, but also just in general, just history. She's just a really interesting figure. And so Paul... Um, spends the first part of this podcast giving us a biography of her who she was and her work and then we go into some cross links between her and Steiner Rudolf Steiner my mate as you guys know um and then we talk a little bit about stuff that's happened in New Zealand we touch on it very briefly but um it has made me want to learn more about a certain thing that happened in 1992 Mm. anyway It was a great podcast and I appreciated Paul taking the time to do it. Uh, He's got heaps of lectures on YouTube that you can watch for free. I've always enjoyed listening to Paul on different podcasts. Um, So I was really grateful and quite privileged that I was able to talk to somebody who I have enjoyed listening to for quite a while. Uh, So yeah, if you just Google Paul Weston or search for him on YouTube, or in Spotify, or iTunes, it will come up with a whole lot of other conversations that he's had, and I recommend you go into it, because uh, they're really good, and very enlightening, and will just make your life a little bit more interesting. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. Um, I tried not to talk too much, because Paul is really good at just letting the information flow out of him, and I didn't really want to get in the way. Um, so yes, just enjoy listening to the stories that Paul is about to tell you and let us know what you think. Please share it about in your different social media places and leave comments wherever you're listening and you can find me on Instagram at, um, the Mystic Waldorf Home NZ. I can't remember if there's an NZ on there. You'll figure it out. Um, or on Facebook. Yeah. So Sit back, enjoy, and I will speak to you at the end of the podcast. Okay, shall we get into it? Yeah, sure. Okay, so kia ora and welcome to the Mystic Discoveries podcast, Paul. I'm really grateful that you're able to talk to me today. It's a pleasure, especially when uh, it's going out that far across the world from Glastonbury, UK. Isn't it wonderful? So yes, you're talking to us from Glastonbury, and I'm um, currently in Wanganui, New Zealand. There are some direct connections which you probably already know about in terms of, <laughs> of the Jews' magic and, and your neck of the woods in terms of Robert Felkin, which probably something you already know about, but we can maybe say a few words about that later on after I've uh, gone through the mic material. I actually don't. That's a name that I've oh, heard oh, of. But it's quite likely going to really interest you when we get round to that then, especially Ooh. as there is, uh, this is a guy that founded the magical order that Dion Fortune became part of, uh, met Rudolf Steiner in Europe and later to camp to New Zealand and set up a whole Golden Dawn scenario out there. But we'll get, we can just do a, a, a brief one on him when we've gone through all the main material. I'm, that's, that's intriguing. And if you didn't know that, that's something that's humming across the airwaves then. That's wonderful. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh, I've got, I'm, I'm glad I had my coffee this morning. Get right into it. So I think we'll start with just why I've asked you to be on the podcast. You kind of already know, but um, I personally, I became aware of Dion Fortune through um, my partner, Reese, who had um, 
started reading her book Psychic Self Defense, and he yeah. and he mentioned it in passing and was just like, "Wow, this is this is crazy!" And I've always been meaning to read it. And then for Christmas, he asked to get her book on the King Arthur mythology because he's been really called to it himself. And I was like, "Oh yeah, that'll be good to have in our collection." And then just randomly one day, I was like, I wonder if anybody's done any YouTube videos on Dion or any podcasts about her, because I just wanted to know more about who she was. Just being a woman occultist from back then is it's just interesting. And then, of course, I came across your lecture, and I've heard your, you talk on various podcasts as well, and I've always really enjoyed what you have to offer and your tone and everything. And I was listening to That's your... Nice to Yep. <laughs> and I was listening to your um, lecture and then you started talking about Dion Fortune. It was obviously about your book, The Occult Battle of Britain, um, but I didn't realise it was so deeply about her. And then as you really got into the guts of it, the door knocked and the book Avalon of the Heart had arrived. The courier just dropped it off and then I opened it. Yeah, it was so wonderful. And I opened it and I was just like, if there wasn't a clearer sign from the universe that I need to find out more about Dion Fortune, I I don't know what could be clearer than that. And then I emailed you that later that day and said, please, please come tell me more about Dion Fortune. And you really kindly agreed. Well, yeah, I'm hoping what we can basically do is, you know, my intention is to go through the very basics of her life and how that developed into her work mm -hmm. and talk a little bit you know about Glastonbury Avalon and the whole the, the whole 1940 thing and I'll say a little bit about how in, in modern times that impacted on me and my own personal experiences I won't say too much about that enough to indicate to people that this subject matter is uh, alive and potent mm. and you can make connections to it you know if you have a disposition to get involved in some group and take up a course of training, fine. But if you don't and you just like to be inspired and move along and just fill your head up with this material and see how, how it comes to life, then that's definitely something that does very strongly happen with Dion Fortune. Wonderful. So would you would you like to just go for it or would you like me to kind of ask questions and you oh, answer oh, them? Oh, oh. You've, you've heard me on Golden White, you've, you've suggested that, that you're quite happy for me to just, just go into Yeah, my, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll do that um, yeah. for starters with a kind of summary of, of what I consider to be, you know, a life, the pertinent stuff concerning her life and work. Please. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll see how that all pans out. I'll pause for breath here and there. And... Yeah. Very good. I'm ready. Okay, okay. So, Dion Fortune, that's obviously not her birth name. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a magical motto that she takes up um, later in her life. She's actually born Violet Mary Firth in 1890 uh, in North Wales. The family have got a fairly interesting background in as much as Firth Steel was a preeminent company uh, during the time of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, making uh, guns that were basically used across the entire world, all the adventures of the British Empire for good and for bad. But her father, um, interesting character, breaks away from that family background, is involved in hydrotherapy, mm. which is a kind of no, this is, a, this is a period of all sorts of um, early alternative therapies and healings, the kind of stuff you, you find in, in, in America and, and the New Thought Movement. You've got that going on here as well. Mm. Now, the story that Dion Fortune likes to tell more than once <laughs> is that as she's born, there's a kind of mysterious possible changeling episode. It seems that she... Uh, stops breathing and there's a concern that she's maybe died and when the baby opens her eyes again you know the mother feels that there's maybe something different about the baby that's opened its eyes now mm. to what extent that's really the case and to what extent she is um, self-mythologizing uh, we can't say now but we can uh, assess how her life uh, works out afterwards 
as to the validity of that. Uh, childhood uh, is comparatively uneventful. Uh, we know that in her early teens she wrote some poetry that got published. Some of that is still around. Quite recently a photograph of her from that period of time surfaced. There's very, very few photos of her, and this was as a deliberate thing. Uh, after she died, the people that were the keepers of all of her papers and material had a very clear policy that they didn't want a cult of personality to grow up around mm. her. So all of her personal effects were destroyed, which is a real shame, but yeah. we've got a few photos from then. Now, it's in 1913 where um, she's out of college that a story occurs that's foundational to her whole life and is the root of the whole book, Psychic Self-Defence, which you mentioned earlier. She comes into conflict with the warden there, uh, a woman who's been out, I think, in Afghanistan and seems to have become an addict of some baleful form of hypnosis that she used to control and manipulate people, uh, to exploit them, um, to get money out of them and so forth. And she comes into conflict, Violet Firth comes into conflict with this warden, and this warden just more or less does this kind of hypnotic induction on her that tells her that she's just worthless and has no self-esteem and, and, and no ability to do any good. And it's, it's more than that. It, there's a kind of um, psychic factor to it whereby it's as if the walls are closing in on her. She listens to some inner voice that says, pretend to give in or you're done for. So she does and makes out, she acquiesces and ends up going off and sleeps for 30 hours. But the damage is worse than that. You know, she the way she writes about it, it's as if there is some hole that's been ripped in her aura. Mm. And it's only later when she becomes initiated into magical orders that this begins to heal. But what it's done, and you see, if, if you... One of the kind of uh, overviews that I've presented in my book, The Occult Battle of Britain, is that I consider that there are events in her life which, although they are a thing in, in themselves, and although they have a continuity simply with her body of work, they're also preparations for what she is to undergo in 1940 as the person who focuses the occult side in Britain, anyway, uh, of the defence against the Nazis. In this case... She's learning to handle um, some pretty powerful negative forces being thrown against her. She's had to come out the other side of that. As a result of all this, she becomes fascinated in the working of the mind. And at that time, uh, the thing that's on everybody's lips uh, who's interested in these things is, is Freudian psychoanalysis, which is just starting to make headway in London. And when the First World War breaks out, she's in London and she's been trained up as a, a lay psychoanalyst. And considering that she's still pretty young, she's getting to actually deal with people that have got all kinds of weird problems. And she's mm -hmm. starting to kind of see aspects of life that most people aren't going to. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, a bit of destiny that not that far away from where she's working, the Theosophical Society have got a branch and whatever's going on in terms of the weird lectures and the things that go that are happening in there they've got a decent canteen that's got a bit of a reputation and she goes in there <laughs> to eat food and inevitably just kind of becomes aware of oh they've got this lecture going on they've got that lecture going on what's this all about and she attends one and again uh, in terms of the formative influence how important this is it's somebody who's basically uh, saying that they're going to um, try and project images, simple images, into people's minds, see whether they pick up on it, and then the image is going to be revealed, and we'll see how many of the audience claim that they've actually uh, seen it in advance. Now, Dale Fortune is startled to see that she is actually picking up these images accurately, and this obviously sets her off uh, on... The realisation that there's a limitation on the Freudian psychoanalytical view of what the, the function of the mind is, there's a reductionism there. In fact, there's something else going on as well. This opens up you know, more interest. Now, not that long afterwards, 
she has a powerful, life-changing dream that she's in um, the reading room of the Theosophical Library mm. and some kind of um, doorway, some portal opens up and she finds herself in some, I think it's a Himalayan vista, and she meets uh, both uh, Christ, Jesus Christ, and Count Saint Germain. Mm. And they represent different kind of uh, rays of healing or, or transmissions in theosophical terms. And she was quite interested in Saint Germain, but she's intrigued that it's Christ who kind of takes her on. Now, as, as an indication that this is not just any old dream, immediately following this for three days, she gets what we now call a download of a whole bunch of, of memories, particularly of Atlantis, but, but past lives and stuff through to modern day. And they're all suggestive of initiation in mystery schools. And they, they, they show her that she's already got a kind of knowledge of occultism and mysticism, which is not consciously in her mind anywhere. Mm. And this, you know, clearly shows to her that, that this is the way forward, that this is something that she, she has to um, follow through on. And so it's in um, 1919 that she gets uh, initiated into one of the various Golden Dawn offshoots. She's also working separately with another guy called Theodore Moriarty, who's a character who, who she describes as, as an adept, if ever there was one. Uh, he's, he's someone that forms the basis of a bunch of, of, of stories that she does in the 20s called The Secrets of Dr. Tavener, which are kind of a cult detective stories where somebody is able to kind of bring their psychism and their magical ability to uh, work with, with haunts and possessions and so forth. All of these things coalesce. And there's another very interesting little episode that I feel is, is again, suggestive of, of, of a job that she's been given an interview for that she doesn't even realise. <laughs> because at that point, uh, now this is 1919, yeah. and it's just after the First World War, things are a bit heavy for the uh, British Empire Raj. There's been the Amritsar massacre, there's a lot of uh, upheaval uh, with the movement that ultimately leads to independence. And there's a theosophical guy called BP Wadia who's, who's very keen on, on getting back to Blavatsky, uh, who, who had you know, died some decades beforehand. He's in Britain and he's giving lectures to people and he's taking them through uh, various processes to get them attuned to the theosophical masters who are all, all tend to be um, of Eastern extraction. And Dion Fortune's feeling, he's, he's quite uh, openly saying that the group soul, as he puts it, of mm. the British Empire is sick and, and kind of needs to be rejuvenated with these external influences. She feels that he's hostile and that actually it's not whatever the rationality of what he appears to be saying and whether you can say that that sounds all right, there's something uh, that's not right about him and in that moment. So she withdraws from the group and then starts to experience uh, some strange stuff with, with what, you, what you'd call psychic attack. And she gets worried about this and some voice, some inner, inner communication to her tells her that um, she's got to put out the feelers to a, a, somebody that wouldn't have necessarily been the first person that she'd think would think about. This is a chap called, called um, JFC Fuller. Now, Fuller um, was a man in the British military. Uh, he was a guy with intelligence connections. He was also, if you had any occult knowledge at that time, somebody that had been very, very close to Alistair Crowley a decade or so earlier, mm. had written a book um, in favour very much of Crowley, but had later fallen out with him, as so many other people did. Mm. He wasn't the sort of person that she was puzzled, but this, this voice basically said to her, or this inner intuition, he's going to turn up at the next public lecture you gave. And indeed he does. And he's, he's likewise, he's had this inner prompting that he needed to turn up. It's, it, there must be a bit of hidden backstory there that we, we can't quite get to. But one way or another, she tells him all about Wadia. And he says, OK, I'm going to handle this. And within days, Wadia has left the country. Decades later, he returns, no problem. It's probably 
Fuller has pulled a few strings amongst his intelligence um, contacts, something like that. Mm. But one way or another, what she's doing, uh, when you think that 20 years later, uh, she's set up to kind of defend, you know, the, the soul of Britain against the Nazis. It's, it's an interesting little little thing. So as we move into the 20s, this is when she first comes to Glastonbury. And she ends up working on a kind of psychic level with a chap who already uh, achieved a certain level of notoriety here, Frederick Bly Bond. Now, he's a pioneer of what we would call psychic archaeology. He had been, um, very interestingly, the first archaeologist to be given full reign to, to work in the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey after it had been bought from private ownership and reverted to the Church of England, and he used automatic writing um, to try and connect with the collective intelligence of the Abbey and find out things about where various hidden chapels were and so forth. This is a very, very interesting story in, in its own right. I do cover Bond uh, fairly extensively in my cult about the Britain. But anyway, he worked with a lot of mediums, a lot of psychics, and actually, through Dion Fortune's mother, who had quite a network of, of, of contacts, he ends up working with her for a short period of time. And she makes contact with what you might call, you know, the inner plane of depths eye uh, in the Glastonbury zone. She makes her own contact with the collective intelligence. She comes up with material about Joseph Ramathia and about the Abbey. And this is really the start of something that, she develops very much in her own way. Is that Dion's um, mother, sorry, or Dion herself? This is D- Dion Fortune makes makes her own oh, yeah. contact. Yeah. You know, yeah. having having been brought in by Bly Bond yeah. connecting to the work he was doing, yeah. she finds stuff that it works its own way through her. And as we move through the twenties, um, she's still kind of working with um, the Golden Dawn magical tradition if you like so this is going to involve all this kind of um immense mental filing cabinet that you're creating for yourself involving you know the kabbalah and astrology and the tarot and all the associations of what archangel is is where and all this kind of stuff and working your way through um in an initiatory process in keeping with the sephir of, of, of the Kabbalistic tree of life. This is all kind of there in the background, but she's also still got uh, a kind of theosophical mindset because her psychism is giving her a whole bunch of stuff about Atlantis and how that's the root of the Western mystery tradition. Mm. And ultimately, she founds her own uh, group, the Inner Light, and to her satisfaction, you know, this is following through from Atlantis and the head of this order is, is Melchizedek. Mm. So this is in the background at the end of the 20s. And it's in 1930, I think, that she produces Psychic Self-Defense, which reminds, you know, for all the ripping yarns in it, <laughs> uh, a classic book. You know, it still has a tremendous effect on people mm. where she's talking about uh, about all these dramatic episodes where people are sending thought forms at her, where she experiences some gigantic cat, where there's vampirism, where there's, where there's the things that happen with her and, and the warden and so on. And that the idea that there are um, a black lodge, if you like, and a white lodge, that there is a kind of, you know, the war in heaven mentality that is, is there throughout all occultism and, and, and a lot of mystical schools that the very strange evocative idea that there's a kind of a cult police that in certain situations there are higher level entities that will come in on the case to help out. All this kind of stuff is in there. Uh, and this is full of personal anecdotes, but then there's also, uh, for a, a period of years in the early 30s, she works on, on a work that's considered to be one of her great masterpieces, the mystical Kabbalah, which is her making uh, accessible to a less specialised audience, the teaching on the Kabbalah that you will find in the Golden Dawn tradition. And this, you know, you can criticise it, it's at odds with some of the other teachings that you might find on the same subject. There's stuff about certain attributions, for example, the tarot cards, 
uh, people who are familiar with, with work such as meditations of the tarot, there are arguments about what goes where. Mm. But as far as I'm concerned and as far as a lot of other people are concerned, uh, the mystical Kabbalah material uh, has real life and vitality in it. And if you allow it to slowly work its way through your system, um, it will come to life. You know, it yeah. will nourish you and yeah. you, you will find that, that there's something, uh, you know, very wonderful about it. Mm. And it's during this same period, uh, we're talking now 1933-34, that she puts out a little uh, collection of essays that she's been writing for little journals and so on, all Glastonbury. And it's called Avalon of the Heart. And, and just mm. this title in itself, to me, is supremely evocative <laughs> of, of what this place is all about. And, and in the, on the first page, she says that the poetry of the soul writes itself at Glastonbury and I have adopted the term soul poetry mm. uh, it, for how I present uh, the legends the mythology that we've got here there, there are you know, all kinds of stories like supposedly uh, the skeleton of King Arthur was, was uncovered in the grounds of Glastonbury Abbey and was later interred in a lavish tomb that was visited by Plantagenet monarchs. There are these stories that the, you know, the first church in Britain was founded by, as early as 63 AD by Joseph Ramathia. Now, these stories, yeah, historians can just tear them to pieces, but if you treat them as soul poetry and you have them in connection with the sense of the landscape here, uh, they form numinous portals in which you can kind of experience a certain feeling tone about these ideas and what they represent, these otherwise unavailable. So in Avalon of the Heart, I think she does this supremely well, supremely well. But it's as we move into um, the mid-30s that she starts to... Um, work on a couple of novels that are, in, for many people, uh, the thing that she's best remembered for and the thing that has uh, given her the most amount of resonance in the modern world. This is The Sea Priestess and Moon Magic. Now, first of all, um, the main characters in these two novels, they are the same person, but they, mm. they, they, they by a slightly different name. There's... there's Vivian Le Fay Morgan and there's Lilith Le Fay Morgan. Now, she has this idea that the characters in the Arthurian stories that we know so well, the main characters, King Arthur himself, Merlin and Morgan, Morgan Le Fay, are not just individuals from a particular period of time, we'll say shortly after the Romans left Britain. They are, in fact, titles. They are initiatory titles. And the lineage that they represent goes all the way back to Atlantis. Now, that's a very wild idea, the, this idea of refugees from Atlantis bringing this kind of knowledge. Uh, and uh, perhaps there's a kind of deliberate crossbreeding between the Atlantean and the Celtic to produce you know, the original Arthur's. But one way or another, it's, it's the idea that through this vehicle, even if you don't believe the Atlantis thing, and I, have, I, you know, I don't endorse that by any means, but there is an idea that there is something about these characters that you can somehow connect with, that they are, are living archetypes. And at the same time as doing this, you know, the title of the first novel is, is The Giveaway Sea Priestess. Mm. Um, she... Is, is, is basically doing something which no one else was, was doing in quite the same way because you've got, at that time, uh, some very strong um, kind of personalities in the Golden Dawn and the various lineages that are all male. You know, you've got yeah. the most famous occultists of the 20th century, Alistair Crowley, and you've got people like Samuel Liddell, McGregor Mathers, who's one of the founders of the Golden Dawn, the style, if you like, that is adopted by the magician is a, is a very kind of male thing with male associations. It's got a certain swagger to it that <laughs> goes all the way back to the Renaissance and prior to that. Mm. But when it comes to how um, a female occultist, mystic, sorceress would be, 
uh, at that point, you know, the uh, associations that you've got with Morgan Le Fay are quite negative, that she's like this negative sorceress who is responsible partly for, you know, the downfall of Arthur. Mm. What the unfortunate is has done because she's presented these characters uh, these novels are all things that happen in, in the modern world and they're happening in everyday landscapes that are recognizable and they're people playing out uh, everyday dramas of the 20th century but they're being kind of overshadowed infused by archetypal magical dramas and they're taking on deeper more resonant roles as they do so they're bringing out some higher function in themselves and so what she's doing is actually showing how a priestess is going to look and think and feel in the, in the modern world mm -hmm. and she's very clear that one of the things that, that it's possible to do with certain kinds of magic is you can work with the collective psyche and you can plant seeds into the collective mind so in certain respects, you know, this is, is a very important time, a decade or so before in this country uh, you get the return of, of witchcraft with the work of Gerald Gardner and you've got a whole thing with the archetype of, of the witch, which is a very kind of power-charged word. Mm. It's got a lot of negative associations in terms of how do you rehabilitate it, how do you give some people a sense of failing and a sense of style and a sense of purpose and what they're really doing. Dale Fulton in these novels is one of the people that has contributed to uh, the rehabilitation of the archetype. So that's a huge thing. You know, there will be many people working within Wicca who will, will cite Dale Fulton as, as a positive influence. Yeah. And at the same time that this is going on, you know, she's, she's obviously she's talking about the Arthurian characters. So she wasn't alone uh, in terms of wondering how you squared all this stuff up with the way uh, the Golden Dawn material used the Kabbalistic Tree of Life as, as a kind of all-purpose filing cabinet. Mm. You know, there were people in the early days, McGregor Mavers was one of them, he was a, a big enthusiast of Celtic mythology, uh, particularly Irish stuff, and of course W.B. Yeats. There was already thoughts of where, you know, where do you fit this stuff on the tree of life? So this is kind of mm. in the background of, of the unfortunate's uh, kind of thinking. And later on, I'm going to kind of jump ahead a little bit here because it does come a point after the great dramas of 1940 and so on, which I will go into detail about soon. Mm -hmm. There is something that's, that's called the Arthurian formula. It's, it's partly her own work and, and an, uh, another medium that she was working with. And they basically try and map out the Arthurian locations such as Camelot and so on, broadly on the Kabbalah. They try and work out where the different characters, you know, what resonances they might have. And this stuff follows through into the modern world. You know, there are, there are, for example, there's a guy, one of the strongest exponents of the unfortunate current is a guy called Gareth Knight. He's quite well known. Mm. He did a book back in, in the early 80s called The Secret Tradition, uh, um, about a secret tradition in, in Arthurian legend that basically takes all this deal fortune material forward. There are a lot of people. Uh, quite well-known people like R.J. Stewart and John and Caitlin Matthews who all came into contact with this material. So this is, is, is part of um, what Dion Fortune, you know, brings forward into the modern world. But it's also, in terms of the destiny thing, in terms of the job, if you like, that she was somehow being trained up for when she resists the baleful warden, when she um, decides to resist BP Wadia, who, who's working against what she took to be the British group. So you've got the great drama um, of 1940, which obviously is the, is the centre of gravity of my book, The Occult Battle of Britain. Mm. And the way all this, this stuff um, unfolds, um, it is uh, quite a study in itself. There was Gareth Knight published in, I think, 1993. Uh, a selection of Dion Fortune's wartime letters under the, the title of The Magical Battle of Britain. And, and this is, is the basic source material. Because what she does 
at this point, uh, magic was something that you know you you join an order, you take oblig you know obligations, oaths, you work comparatively secretively. You have grades, you have particular information which you, you can work with for six months and you've got to show that you, you've mastered it before the next stuff comes along. It's hierarchical, it's part of, a, of an older system mm. that's part of the whole social structure, you could say. <clears throat> but what the unfortunate felt was that with the dire situation uh, of what was occurring at that time, that she would democratise this and that anybody was, who was interested they would send out some, some letters every week with the basics of a kind of visualisation and people would get themselves ready for it and on a Sunday morning, I think it was something like quarter past 11 of a Sunday morning, people around the country, there was, I don't know, maybe about 100 recipients for these letters, would all join together and just close their eyes in there and you know, sit in an armchair <laughs> and visualise whatever it was and see whether this came to life in whatever way and if an interest in it came about. And then they'd write a report on it and send it back to where Deal Fortune was based in London at the time and this would in turn affect uh, what happened. So the impetus to do this begins in October 1939. Now at this point, they're in London and the suggestion is that everybody focuses their attention on this London base. You know, the people that are actually in London are doing some obvious occultist stuff. They're drawing pentagrams in the air and invoking angels and stuff before this visualisation kicks in. But everybody else is just doing something pretty simple. Mm. Now, after a few weeks, uh, one of the people involved says, well, I kept trying to pay attention to London and point myself in the direction of that, but I kept coming back to Glastonbury. Now, Dion Fortune had a base in Glastonbury at the foot of Glastonbury tour. She had a little place that was kind of like, um, they called it the Chalice Orchard Club. There was a place, that, that there was a building uh, that was big enough for a few people to stay in and so forth, and a lot of people that were part involved in her work in the 30s had come there. So many of the people that, rece that received these letters would be familiar with Glastonbury. Mm. When this person said, look, I just kept on thinking about Glastonbury, that was enough for Dion Fortune to just think, well, okay, we are being met halfway. The idea was you, you bring your imagination into this imagery and the masters, the hidden forces behind it all, will meet you halfway. They will, they will bring this imagery to life and you will start to interact with it. So from that point on, um, and it takes a while, it takes a few few months for it to all unfold, but they build up this quite vivid uh, visual scene where they're imagining the famous Glastonbury tour, you know, the big 500 foot tall hill that we've got here with just this ruined tower of a church on top of it, but it's hollow. And inside this, this hollowed out cavern is the place where, you know, the beings of light assemble and there's an enormous great... Um, Rose cross hanging in the air and a triple beam of light behind it and imagery mm -hmm. appears around it ab above, below and either side of it that is in accordance with um, Kabbalistic Sephiroth but you don't necessarily have to know anything about that to appreciate that the way this hangs together uh, and the imagery takes a while, it shifts around but the final form of it which, which only really arrives in, in April 1940, is above this rose cross, you've got an image of Christ. And when I say an image, this is like, you know, uh, it's alive. It's like it's a portal into somewhere where the reality of what that image represents is, is, is present. Mm. Underneath it, you've got the Virgin Mary um, holding um, a chalice. And on one side of the cross... Um, to the left of it, you've got uh, an image of King Arthur seated on a white horse holding a loft Excalibur. And to the right of it, you've got Merlin seated on a throne um, holding a, an orb of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Now, what this, uh, to me, very nicely presents is an equilibration of, of Glastonbury and indeed the whole of, of the nation's kind of Christian and pagan heritage um, cohering when it really matters yeah. and people would, would build this this imagery up occasionally there were things 
that stepped outside that earlier on in the year, there had been enormous great angels um, standing on the shores of the North Sea. You know, at one point, uh, there was an attempt to use angelic forces and flashes of lightning to clear the clouds above Britain uh, and the inertia that was present in the early part of the year, uh, the early part of the war before Winston Churchill became Prime Minister. There are these kind of things going on. Now, what's intriguing for me is in the years immediately running into the war, uh, she has identified herself with Morgan. Mm -hmm. Now, the early roots of this figure, you know, before Arthurian mythology, if you like, there's a figure in in the Irish myths, it's called the Morrigan or the Morrigan, and she's a battle goddess. Uh, Now, my feeling is, uh, and there are a lot of people working with the idea that there was a tremendous Irish influence on Glastonbury in the early days, Mm. and and a lot of to and fro in is that essentially, whether she knew it or not, she became the battle goddess at this period. She took that on uh, when it was really, really necessary uh, that she did that. So there's that kind of thing going on. Yeah, this is is more than enough to be going on with. (laughs) But there's also um, something that I've become aware of years beforehand. Um, I've become fascinated with the subject of Nazi occultism. I've done a dissertation on it. towards my university degree as far back as 1983. So I was aware of the fact that the Nazis had uh, their own grail castle, that Heinrich Himmler had had got hold of this um, schloss called Fablesburg and lavished enormous great attention on it and resources to turn it into into his grail castle. And there's, just as Dion Fortune had got a whole bunch of Atlantean material in the back of her head that was extremely important and was at the roots of her magical identity, you know, as being somebody that had got reincarnations going back to Atlantis and believed that Morgan, you know, ultimately went back to Atlantis. There's a guy called Carl Maria Villiger. I won't say too much about him. He's been called Himmler's Rasputin. He's the guy who really sets a style template for Babelsberg. And he's someone who likewise believes that he's got ancestral memories that go all the way back to Atlantis. Atlantology was a big thing in the Germany of the 20s and 30s, not just with the Nazis, but right across the board. And Mm -hmm. when the Nazis come into power, some of this stuff, you know, is given resources to express itself. And the definitive form of that is at Babelsberg. Uh, There's a whole bunch of, of, of iconography and weird runes and stuff that are put there under the direction of, of Villiger. And there's a whole you know, complex calendar of, of events and stuff that goes down. And what I find really interesting is, you know, we know all about this now. Um, certainly the British knew that the Nazis were invoking mythological energies and archetypes. It's obvious that there must have been a cultist with them. You know, the unfortunate is tuned into this, but nobody at that time knew anything about Babelsberg. You know, mm. British intelligence didn't seem to know anything about it. It's only after the war that the existence of this place and what it's all about is even, you know, made visible. And there was a novel uh, written, I think, in the 80s by a guy called Duncan Kyle. It's just a spy novel, but it's set in Babelsberg. It's called Black Camelot. And that, to me, really kind of sums up the vibe there. And I found it very, very, very interesting that you've got Glastonbury with its Arthurian associations becoming, you know, the psychological, emotional, magical focus of the resistance to whatever it was of that nature that the Nazis were flinging at us. And the core of what they were all about in that respect is unquestionably Babelsberg. There's a, there's a lot of very dubious material concerning what extent Hitler was, was an occultist and so on. None of that you can say is proven. Mm. But with him and with Babelsberg, there simply isn't any doubt about it whatsoever. And what I found, you know, I've, I've mentioned this in my book, what I found really, really interesting was that Villiger was, was a controversial figure. He was a bit of an alcoholic. He did have mental health episodes. He had enemies in the SS. He was actually taken out of commission um, about 
a couple of weeks before the invasion of Poland. Right. So at the point where, you know, the magical engine, if you like, of Babelsberg and its resident Magus uh, could have been at their most potent, he's kind of removed from the equation, which mm. is very, very interesting. And to show that he and the old fortune are kind of connected in some way by some strange destiny, um, at the end of the war, they both die in the same week, oh, in wow. January 1946, which kind of suggests that they were, um, you know, in some way by fate and destiny, working some kind of mysterious pattern out there. So all of that is, is kind of kind of there in the book, and it is suggested that, you know, Dion Fortune came under a tremendous strain as a result of holding all this together. And, and quite probably, you know, her life was short and she succumbed to, I think, leukemia within a short period of time after the war mm. is over. But what's really interesting, going through this, the source material, um, the letters, is the fact that quite early on in the, in the day, even when the Battle of Britain physically is, is raging in the sky above, she's already confident that the tide has turned. She's already confident that, that the war is won. And, you know, the war had an awful lot longer to go on and was going to get tremendously worse with the attack on Russia the next year and so on. Mm -hmm. But what she's saying is that the workings that they're doing there, this imagining of Arthur and Glastonbury and so on, is not just about that period of time. It's about, and she uses a specific terminology, the new age to come. You know, she's actually calling it the new age. And that somehow or another something is being done in the collective consciousness of Britain with these Arthurian archetypes and this whatever's going on there. And it's for a later time. And, and this, to me, um, has been proven, you know, emphatically, uh, with, with my own experiences. Now, what I'll do is I'll pause there because I'm moving out of the realm of her distinct biography yeah. into realms of, of my experiences. If you want to go back over any of that or if there's anything you want me to say a little bit more about or whatever. Um, no, I think that's covered it quite well. When, you've, when you're ready to talk about your own experiences, that would be great. No, oh, it's so I'm interesting. Also, but I must... Maybe. I must actually say, you mentioned in passing Meditations on the Tarot. I've, it's, it's quite a significant book for, for me, myself, but um, I don't often hear people mention it. Do you, do you uh, consider it I kind see, of a... I know a few people that are pretty big on it. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know, it's interesting. You know, which is like, you know, 60, so I've been, been reading this stuff for like more than 40 years. I've been into these topics, so it's kind of come on my radar. It would. You know, a certain amount of regularity, whereas, yeah. you know, it might be possible for other people to, to miss it. But I have a great interest in, you know, hermeticism and in the Christian mysticism of, of all the material that you've got from the Middle Ages that forms the imagery and background of the tarot and so forth. So it's it's been on my radar. And, you know, I do have a few friends that are... are great proponents of it and we'll take that over the gold dawn crowley tarot any day of the week but there we are yeah interesting do you are you into it yourself or is it kind of just a more interesting book for you rather than um, what, I, what i would say i'm i've got going with it is that the spirit that's in it mm. the transition if you like which is a kind of christian hermeticism uh and which shows how um, you know, the Christianity of the Middle Ages and since is not just some monolithic thing uh, of, of the Spanish Inquisition and a whole intolerant horror show. But in fact, in what I call the Gothic Cathedral, the, the Grail Epoch of the 12th century, there is it's just uh, a mind-shattering uh, amount of, of extraordinary wisdom and nourishment which is actually you know a very very powerful foundation all the imagery of that time you know and the tarot cards are, are in many ways proof of it the, me the early medieval imagery is still incredibly powerful uh, and potent and mm. i'm always energized by that and the mm. fact that i'm in glastonbury and that I, I, i've got a season ticket to glastonbury abbey and that i'll spend at least a little bit of time in there 
almost every day I've got that period of time mm. and I'm really alive within me and I am constantly communing with it and it infuses my writing. So in that sense, what's in meditations to tell where it's specific details, the overall feel of yeah. that entire current um, is something, you know, that is, is there with me. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that little aside. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go into then um, my own experiences yeah. with the 1940 material. So, so yeah, I, I, I knew a fair old amount about this already. I knew the Nazi cults and background. I'd read... Magical Battle of Britain, the wartime letters, when it first came out in 1993. Now, when we come to May 1995, I'm already involved in a scenario that I've, I've gambled by taking a redundancy scheme at the job that I was in, in Essex, in order to get enough money to try and move to Glastonbury. So that's already going on. But in the greater life of the nation, We've just about to come up to the 50th anniversary of the end of the war in Europe. Mm. Uh, so this was going to be a mighty big deal that year. You know, that generation that were part of all that getting older and older, so the amount of people that can be part of these things is diminishing. So there's quite an emotional tone on it. And the way they were going to work it was that there was going to be um, a two-minute silence in the early evening. And that was going to be followed by the lighting of beacon fires all around the country, including on Glastonbury Tour. And the thing was going to be um, anchored in London. There was a huge event in, in Hyde Park, and the Queen was going to be there. And at the end of it all, at the end of the two-minute silence, she was going to um, you know, set a signal off that would uh, get these beacons there everywhere. Now, on that day, I was kind of watching live stuff that was going on in London on the TV and it, I, I just had a feeling that I, I just felt quite drab and I, I wasn't connected to it and something wasn't quite right and wasn't quite happening and at that point I had a copy of Avalon of the Heart and it was an edition that had a photograph of Glastonbury Tour on the cover and it was literally um, on the floor in my living room by the side of the TV and I got kind of fed up with what was on the TV and I turned it off. And I was just sitting there thinking, well, this doesn't feel like it, it meets the re emotional requirements that I, I have for a day like this. <laughs> yeah. And it was quite a, 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 not a very sunny day, but suddenly, literally, and this is no word of a lie, a ray of sunshine came through the window and hit the cover of Avalon of the Heart on mm. the floor and, you know, briefly the image of Glastonbury Tour, and at that moment, instantly, instantly, I knew what, I, what had to be done and what I was going to do. I would, in that two-minute silence, attempt to go into the same space as the 1940 meditations. In other words, I would imagine myself inside Glastonbury Tour and Arthur and Merlin and so on were in there, and I would make whatever connection with that. And at that point, this is 1995, so we've got no internet, no Facebook, none of all these kind of things. I ring a few people up that I know around the country who I think might be up for doing that, and, and about half a dozen people are up for it. So when it comes to um, that evening, um, in that two minutes, I met, I'm, I've got my... You know, I've made it. I've set myself up quite nicely. I've got the whole rooms lit up with candles and so on, and I've just gone into this silent space and I've closed my eyes, and, and it was extremely emotional, extremely emotional. It felt incredibly powerful, and I came out of it, and, and I'd already pulled a tarot card for that day, which was the lightning struck tower, and oh. I thought, well, oh, that's a bit. <laughs> potentially disruptive when people pull that they're normally a bit concerned about what's going to happen <laughs> yeah so i turned the tv on the moment i came out of the two minutes and there's the queen in hyde park and she's standing in front of some high-tech console and she presses a button and basically this fires a laser beam at the gpo tower in london which is with, uh, and these lights circle all the way up the top of the tower and then all these fireworks come shooting out the top of it and that is wow. the cue for the 
um, bacon lightning. And I thought, well, if that's not the lightning struck tower, I don't know what is. And that <laughs> just, just set me up a tree. And then I got, you know, the experiences of other people. Uh, there was one person who saw a very, very powerful vision of a naked half a pin dragon and incredible energy shooting around the landscape and so on that just said to me that the archetype, the energy is, is, is very alive. It's not just fixed in some, you know, Tennysonian stead Victorian uh, form. Mm. It, it's something that, that is alive and kicking now. And it was within literally a matter of weeks after that that my way um, to Glastonbury was, was made clear and, and I was able to move there. And I, I remain convinced that that particular occasion was, was a, a very important kind of portal opening for me in doing that. So when I came here, you know, I, I, I gave a, the first year I was here in 1995, I gave a public presentation on Dion Fortune's birthday about some of my experiences and about the, the Cold War and so forth. And I started, um, you know, pondering this imagery uh, a lot. And I found in the following year that um, I began to just ensure additional imagery because there, there's, you know, a certain amount of the Sephiroth, the Tree of Life, are featured in the 1940 imagery, uh, but there are other missing Sephiroth. And inspired by how imagery is built up in the mystical cabal of the unfortunate, I very easily came to um, my own version of some of the other uh, Sephiroth using Glastonbury imagery. And this was all happening, by the way, when I was working in a plastic mouldings factory. I was just doing this kind of robotic work mm. that meant not sewn out and just going to this reverie. And the whole thing came to me very easily and formed the basis of, of what I'll call A Glastonbury Kabbalah, which is featured in my first book, Mysterium Artorius. And it's been, been published a few times in blogs and, and in magazines and stuff. And in 1996, on Dion Fortune's birthday, I did a public visualisation using that material. And it worked incredibly well. You know, people had very, very, very strong experiences and it seemed as if this stuff, um, it wasn't a case of trying to imagine something, it was a case of seeing something that was somehow already there, wow. uh, which is very intriguing to me. And this was kind of... Um, further enhanced in 1997 when Princess Diana died because there was something very, very um, mythological about this whole thing. Yeah. And it was kind of made very, very clear to me when um, it became known that she was going to be interred on an island in a lake and the British press started using this uh, headline, The Lady of the Lake. Now, what I found very interesting at that point was that people um, had a lot of good feeling for Prince William and were happy with the idea that he was the king. And it was because of the fact, not that he was Charles's son, but because he was Diana's son. Mm. And in this respect, she was taking on a very, very ancient archetype that you don't exactly get talked about that much anymore, the bestower of sovereignty, which mm. is exactly what the lady of the lake was. And I, I kind of realised that it was already obvious that something very potent was going on. And it came, it came to me that on the, on the, the Dion Fortune workings could be accommodated um, for the night before her funeral and the night, the actual night of her funeral. So a group of us gathered together and, and the night before visualised London because there were already people camping out on the streets. There was a hell of a lot of activity already that there was an enormous great, you know, parade of titanic angels with flaming swords standing guard everywhere, all this kind of stuff. And then on the night itself of the funeral, um, the imagery was kind of adjusted so that um, inside, uh, how it was seen was the Arthur vision was set in Westminster Abbey, which is where we have the coronation of our monarchs, and King Arthur himself was seated on the throne. And... You know, Prince William was kneeling before him and Arthur was knighting him with Excalibur. And the Merlin imagery was Windsor Castle, which is, you know, this one of the seats of the royal family. And the grounds of Windsor Castle are associated with a figure called Herne the Hunter, who's very much a form of the horned god. You know, there's, there's poems about him, he's mentioned in Shakespeare, he's 
quite a big deal in this country. Mm. And Merlin, you know, the mythology of Merlin, the source material of Merlin, um, it, it works that one could see him as a form of the horned god. So there's a gigantic form of Merlin, kind of as Hearn the Hunter, holding this orb of sovereignty above Winter Castle, and the royals are all kind of in front of it. And, you know, on that particular night, um, it, were, it was very, very potent. It was very, very easy to see this stuff and to feel that something incredibly powerful and unknown, you know, you can never totally understand it, was working its way um, through the system. And, and, you know, this kind of thing continues, you know, um, just before our general election here, uh, on Dion Fortune's birthday last year, a small group of us gathered together and, and we did the working again, you know, and I'm, I'm in cahoots here with a guy called James North who's been part of the Dion Fortune in a light and he's now kind of doing his own thing and has got a lot of background in the Western Mysteries tradition uh, and we were at the, uh, the home of him and his, his wife Sally and it, uh, it, James did some pentagrams and did the invocations and all the rest of it. And all I really did was read out slowly my Glastonbury Kabbalah from the Steel Martorius and a group of people entered into that visualisation and then you leave them there and for five minutes they just see where they go with it and then you bring people back. And there was some astonishing stuff going on. And in terms of where I got to with it, um, I've now, since then, uh, stimulated by the general election and the mystery of our bizarre Prime Minister, um, I'm writing a whole, a whole book called History and Myth, which is tied in with the way in which Boris Johnson, what's going on with him, strangely resonates with the period of Henry VIII and the dissolution of the monasteries and the break with Europe and a whole bunch of stuff that happened. The la round about the last time we had the enormous great astrological uh, Stan and Pluto in, in Capricorn, which we just had a couple of weeks ago. I've gone back in time to previous occasions when that happened, and I've seen resonances. I've got all this mileage, basically, out of uh, just doing the deal, fortune, Glastonbury and Kabbalah working. So, you wow. know, at the same time, um, me and James were doing this thing, Avalon of the Heart Tours. So, I'm, you know, I'm a tour guide in Glastonbury, and I'm working it with the Dion Fortune sensibilities, with that idea of, of, of soul poetry. So all this stuff works its way through. You know, all this all this stuff is been something that, you know, nobody kind of trains me up and says, well, this is what you've got to do. I've just been activated through my connections with other things, and I've just read this stuff a zillion times over, and mm -hmm. I've just got a mindset of, of how to interact with it and when there's a time to do this and, and do that. And, and so it has transpired, you know, and mm. I think that that is, is the possibility uh, for anyone, really, who, who's got the temperament, who's got the predisposition uh, to ne connect up to it in that way. So that's, you know, that's, that's my stuff in summary. Um, we, can, we can go into, because obviously you've got your Steiner background, we can go into a, a mm. little bit of all that as well. Um, however you want to run with that. Yeah, thank you. Gosh. Oh my gosh, it's so interesting. Um, yeah, I think it would be interesting to talk about uh, Rudolf Steiner because as you know, I'm a, I, he's kind of guided my spiritual path, but I'm also really, I, I really liked, I, I just love how you work, how you um, wrote your book and you kind of like have linked all these different things happening at the same time or on this kind of like massive matrix of a timeline and how you were able to kind of uh, show what Steiner was doing around the same time as what other occultists around the place were up to. Um, and yeah, I just, I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Right, I'll run with that a little bit. Please now, do. First of all, my predisposition is that I, I started out as a history nerd. Yeah. So when I was pretty young, you know, uh, as young as 10, and certainly by the time I was 12, I'm just reading history books all the time, and mm. I've got uh, a neurotic propensity to just be able to remember the names and the dates. I've got all the basics of, you know, the 20th century, the two world wars, and so on, are just there in my head. You oh, know, I can wrap right. off the names of all the kings and queens from William the Cold War onwards. All that is just part of the mental furniture. So... When I then 
get all this occultist material in my head, it goes in against that filing cabinet. Mm. And, and the way the book panned out, the way the book was, was created, I'd, you know, I've mentioned this collision between Glastonbury and Babelsberg, both of these developments, you know, where the unfortunate's at in 1940 is the, the summation of a period of time that's 50 years in the making yeah. of the region of Glastonbury, and it's the same with Babelsberg. Babelsberg is also something that is, is an expression of a culture that's 50 years in the making. So there's, there was a great book by a guy called Patrick Benham called The Avalonians, which was all about the, the, the characters, including Dion Fortune, who were around for the rebirth in Glastonbury, Frederick Blybond and so on. And there was also a great book called The Occult Roots of Nazism by Nicholas Goodrich Clark, which was one of the few academically acceptable books on this on this subject on which there's been so much nonsense. Yeah. And what I thought I'd do was I'd basically get a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet together and I'd have columns uh, for dates, and I'd have, have you know vertical columns for Glastonbury in Germany, and I would read the two books back to back, and anything that I thought was interesting, I'd just enter it at the relevant year, mm. um, my spreadsheet, and then when I'd done that, I'd read across the across the columns for the years and see if there were things happening that seemed to somehow be part of a bigger picture. So that you know, on, having done that, having got that as the foundation. So that's where everything else can come in. That's where I can put in what's happening to Hitler, what's happening to Churchill, and where Steiner is at. Mm. Because I was very aware of the fact that there's simply no way that uh, people like Dion Fortune couldn't have been aware of Rudolf Steiner mm -hmm. during the period, you know, of of her own, you know, magical life because. We have to remember that Steiner was a pretty big deal, you know. He yeah. was probably, when it came to the, the First World War, at the time of the First World War, he's probably the most famous mystical occultist type figure in the whole uh, of Europe, you know. And on the, as by virtue of, of the proof of that, it's the fact that he can be hanging out with Helmut von Mulcke, who's the guy that's in charge of the German attack, you know, on, yeah. the, on the West Front in 1914. I mean, this comes about through an association with his wife, but he's known these characters for decades, and, you know, he's talking to von Mulcke uh, at the time of, of the absolutely crucial events in the early part of the First World War, where the, the, the famous Schlieffen plan um, doesn't quite work out the way it's supposed to, and, mm. and, there's, and von Mulcke gets gets blamed for this and kind of pensioned off. And there is indeed, you know, a whole uh, pretty impenetrable collection of correspondence and stuff that Steiner had to say about von Mulcke called Light, Light the New Millennium, which shows how uniquely um, in Steiner's work, after von Mulcke died in 1916, Steiner believes that he's still somehow in contact with him. And he talks about what's happening to his soul and the path of evolution. There is stuff while he's still alive that he's maybe been, you know, he's a reincarnation of somebody that was part of a similar drama back in the ninth century and so on and so forth. Steiner is actually entrusted by uh, von Molke's widow with uh, a short work that von Molke wrote during his retirement on his version of what happened in 1914. And Steiner was actually hoping to go along to the Versailles Peace Conference um, in 1919 and present this as evidence against Germany being solely guilty for what had happened. Mm. But the German High Command felt there were certain things in it that were detrimental to what they wanted to communicate, and he wasn't able to. But the fact that he is even moving in these kind of circles and uh, this is even a possibility that a guy, you know, who, who seems so strange by conventional standards <laughs> can possibly even turn up at the Versailles Peace Treaty Conference. And yeah. during the end part of the war, he's coming up with the, these theories of, of um, how the economy should work, social conditions and so on, the threefold social order. Mm. And he's getting such coverage 
for this, that in a very, very early um, article for the Nazi uh, newspaper, Hitler himself, I think it's 1921, Hitler himself is, is slagging off Steiner and, and bringing some hate to him. Yeah. So it shows that he must be considered to, to be important. So first of all, there's no way that he's not known about one way or another by by any British mystics, any British occultists are going to know about him. And, and he's got, you know, stuff to say about mystery schools and particularly about the Arthurian mysteries. He's got a whole enormous corpus of material. Mm. And in the 1920s, um, I've, I've, I've gone into this quite deeply uh, in a cult battle of Britain. I've talked about it a little bit in some other books, but I really got taken over with this one. He, in 1924, where he's already uh, only a year away from his, his death, he goes to Tintagel, which is the place, other than Glastonbury, that's got the strongest mythological Arthurian associations in this country. It's where he's supposed to be born. The castle is supposed to be in Arthur's castle. All kinds of stuff is there. The history, just like the Glastonbury, is dubious. But Steiner goes there in, in August 1924, and he's got quite a, a, a distinguished group of people with him, to say the least. The whole thing has been facilitated by the visionary artist Eleanor Merry, um, who, who's quite a figure in her, in her own right. She wrote a book called The Flaming Door in the 30s, all about Celtic mysticism and the mysticism of the Middle Ages and the Christian church and so on. She's responsible for him being there. There's two, there's two carloads of people, and he with clairvoyant vision, reckons that he sees um, the whole locale as it was in the past, that it had been the site of a mystery school like in Lucis, that, yeah. you know, the Arthurian knights had been in contact. You know, one of the, the things, the interesting ideas he puts out is that before Christ physically incarnated, it was possible to make contact with him. You know, mm. even if people wouldn't have understood it in the, in the way that they would understand it after he's been and everything's been clarified, that, you know, the current events cast their shadow. And yeah. that Arthur and, and his knights, um, right from the word go, are connected to Archangel Michael and are connected to the coming of Christ, and that they later play this out in, in historical times. Now, there's a whole bunch of stuff about how. You know, the archaeology of the cast, the uh, Tintagel, what we know about it, how this doesn't all quite hang together. But there's something very, very powerful about what, what Stein is saying there. And the bigger kind of picture that he's working with is this idea that's come from this um, Abbot Trithemius that there's a sequence of ages in history that are presided over by different archangels. And uh, in 1879, we entered into a period of time where the archangel Michael kind of takes command. Mm. And uh, this is, you know, this goes around in cycles, but the particular one we're entering into now is a biggie, you know, yeah. and uh, the return of Christ on the etheric, all these kind of things are, are, are all geared up for this. And that therefore you're going to get a certain amount of what you might call a book of revelations drama playing out. And he talks, there's some really interesting stuff about what preceded 1879, that there's a huge, great tussle in the invisible worlds. You know, that there are, there are beings of darkness that have been cast down from heaven uh, and are now kind of taken in on human form, if you like, and working their way through human beings. And he says it again at the end. It's very interesting. I mean, maybe the Russian Revolution was, was one of the things that set him off on this. But at the end of the First World War, when some people are kind of very optimistic that it's the war to end all wars and that things are going to be all right, he's already talking about the fact that the that, that dark forces are, are now, they've been forced out of heaven by Archangel Michael and they're going to work their way through. Mm. So in the midst of all of this, I just thought to myself, well, look, if this is even remotely true <laughs> in any sense at all, then there's going to be, you know, other people that kind of tune into it or express it in their own way. Of course. Now, in, in you know, Glastonbury Tour, is the, the ruined church on top of there is dedicated to Archangel Michael. There, it, it, 
there's a, a famous ley line, probably the most famous ley line in the world, the, the Michael line. Now, although it's first written about in the 60s by a guy called John Michel in his famous book, The Urban Atlantis, where he, he basically shows that from here down to Cornwall, there are there some very interesting, you know, hilltop churches dedicated to Michael that seem to all be in the line. There are indications that a few people, such as Dion Fortune and also Catherine Maltwood, who was responsible for the idea of the glass, so-called Glassman Zodiac, that this was kind of known about back in the 30s. And, and the fact that the place that is the focal point of the resistance to Nazis in 1940 is uh, sacred to Archangel Michael. That was that was a little resonance there. Yeah. But there was a guy who was working um, along similar lines, who was actually a kind of, uh, his family knew Dion Fortune's family, a guy called Wilson Tudor Palm again. I've, uh, too big a subject to go into detail here, but I've talked about him extensively in my book. He was somebody who uh, had a great spiritual adventure in Glastonbury uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, where he uh, and some female associates had found a, a very mysterious artifact <coughs> that you know, seemed to have associations with Jesus and, and was touted as a Glastonbury grail, you know, and a bit of a nine-day wonder. <laughs> But the real story behind it is very interesting. Yeah. And Paul was very, very dedicated to Archangel Michael. And there's there's no question. You can find him, um, you know, giving presentations and lectures at the same sort of gatherings where there are anthroposophists and so on. In the 20s and into the 30s, he, he this artifact, the blue glass bowl, and he took it around the country to places that were dedicated to Archangel Michael. You know, Dion Fortune was on his mailing list mm. and there's a letter <coughs> that went out in the early 30s where they're talking about power centres of Britain and, and, and giving, you know, considerable veneration to Archangel Michael. And he keeps this going <coughs> for the whole of his life. So there's there's this kind of sense that, um, you know, something is going on there. Now, there, there are... For years now, I've tried to kind of pin down, you know, things that, that there must be some information somewhere. See, Steiner has so much to say about Arthur. Yeah. He has so much to say about the Arthurian mysteries. And you've gone to Tintagel, he's, you know, had a whole bunch of things to say about that. Now, his collective works are now online, as I'm sure you know, and mm. you can search. You know, you can search them to find stuff. He's got stuff to say about Joseph Amathea. Uh, and yet, as far as I know, I've never been able to find a single reference to Glastonbury anywhere. Uh, now, when one considers how much he has to say about the mystical schools associated with medieval cathedrals like Chartres, you know, the medieval mystics, it seems absolutely mysterious that he hasn't got a word to say about this place, especially being as Eleanor Mary does have quite a bit to say about it, you know, 10 years after he's dead in the flaming flaming door. Mm. And in 1932, you know, I've discovered that there was a conference in Glastonbury where the famous Walter Johanna Stein, uh, you know, a major, major pupil of Steiner who had much to say about, about the Grail and about the 9th century and so on, he actually spoke in Glastonbury. Uh, Eleanor Merry was present. Now, this is the same epoch that Dion Fortune has got the Chalice Orchard Club. You know, she's not in Glastonbury all the time. She goes back and forth to London. But there are people that are associated with her that are in town and that are staying there. What are the chances that there's no co-mingling between any of these groups of people? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I thought it was absolutely obvious that there would be. Yeah. But it has left... Um, an obvious paper trail, but you know, I I I've got my radar attuned. You know? <laughs> uh, I just felt that, that I had to just finish the book. I'd been on it for eight years. I could be on it forever. That yeah. I'd got enough at that point to do it. But um, I mentioned at the start of the conversation, um, it's chap Robert Felkin. Oh yeah. Um, Robert Felkin has uh, been part of what you might call the Golden Dawn tradition. There are all these kind of schisms with it in the, in the early part of, of the 
last century. And people, you know, took their, the teaching and founded their own versions of it. And the Stella Matutina, which was the order that Dion Fortune ultimately um, becomes associated with, he's, he's actually the guy that kicks this off. And Is he's he quite British? an chap because he's, he's, he's very interested in Rosicrucianism. Mm -hmm. And we know that he went um, to, into Europe and that he, he met Steiner and that they had all kinds of conversations about Rosicrucianism. This is another one of these cross-references because to, to Steiner, his, his anthroposophy is a, a Rosicrucian school, you know, mm. and it's a school of the Michaelic Mysteries. Yeah. And the inner order of the Golden Dawn, when you get to a certain point, you know, the whole inner realm that's seen in the 1940s workings is considered on one level to be the inside of the tomb of Christian Rosencruz. So all that is kind of there or thereabouts. Uh, and he goes to New Zealand um, in 1912 um, at a place called um, Have Look North, is it? Yeah, um, that's, uh, where the, uh, that's where the first um, Steiner School yeah, in New well, Zealand he, was he, formed. He founded uh, a whole branch of Stella Matutina there under, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but he, he basically sets that whole thing up. Interesting. In goes back and forth, and, and yeah, um, I mean, there was a whole kind of scene there um, that was, you know, like a little new age, little mini Findle and Glastonbury thing going on there around about then, yeah. and what he was doing, which cross-fertilised with Steiner, uh, was all part of that scene then. So you have actually got, you know, um, a kind of deal fortuned golden dawn with Steiner infusions thing that actually crosses over to New Zealand. Uh, mm. I think it's not in 12 he goes over there. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think, I, I can't remember the title, but there, some guy did a book on it. Yeah. Uh, and the whole scene of the early, um, you know, cross fertilization of theosophists and mystics and spiritualists and Golden Dawn and how that later filters through into New Age and UFOs and whatnot, all in. All in your neck of the woods, oh, so you know there's a whole bunch look of into it. stuff going on there, uh, which is 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 part of one of the many reasons why I just find it you know excellent that we are conversing across the world in such a manner and mm. reaffirming in some bizarre way, you know whatever those currents, whatever that transmission is. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Oh my gosh, I I think I've heard of that book. I need to look into it because there's lots of interesting stuff that happens in New Zealand. But um, because we're a small population and we're relatively a new, well, we're not new. Indigenous people have been here for a long time, but you know what I mean. There's kind of yeah, because even the Maori have only been here for a couple of thousand years. So there's interesting stuff happening on this landscape, um, energy wise. It feels well, it's, uh... It was in 1992 with 11.11, which I, I wrote about at that length in my Atagatis, because that was uh, one of the big focuses of, of that global New Age event, as, as presumably that's left some kind of uh, echo there for you to pick up on, that you're aware of all that stuff that happened then. It, it happened when, sorry? In, gen in January 1992, the 11.11 11 event. The 11.11 11 event? You're, you're not aware of that. That was kind no. of an enormous global event that was focused primarily in New Zealand and also in Egypt on the Giza Plateau. Oh. Do you well, have time to tell case, me about there's, it? There's a little, <laughs> so, I, have, I have written at length about that. Oh, you have? Done somewhere, but it's in my other guy's book. But it's not difficult to find the uh, Solara, um, S-O-L-A-R-A, was the uh, the woman that uh, got all that together? There's a there's a load of stuff that you can very easily find about what that was all about. But yeah, there was it was a synchronised event across 36 hours across the globe. And, wow. Um, New Zealand was considered to be part of some uh, very you know advanced vortex of energies that had to be activated in order for that to uh, to kick off. That was in January 1992, and then there was a further sequence of little things that happened all around the world. Uh, for some time after that. Interesting. Interesting. I'll look into that myself. I could talk to you for a long, long, long time and ask you more questions, but I, actually a lot of it is in your book anyway, The Occult Battle of Britain. Um, so is there anywhere else you I mean, want... 
about an hour and a half there. Um, I like to think that what I've done there is very condensed. And yeah. It, it kept its own voltage, and that people who hear it um, will will respond if there's something that particularly interests them about it. Then like, the resources are there through my through my book and elsewhere um, to follow up on that. Uh, what I've tried to do is, is just really put a, a, a condensed transmission of, of all that subject matter that, that carries, you know, the maximum amount of potential reach in the shortest amount of words. Indeed, I, I really appreciate it. I think it's been a good length and um, a really good introduction. If I was looking for a little intro to Dion Fortune, I think that this would be quite a good one. You've got a good one. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, I, I hope... You'll listen to likewise. Yeah, I'm sure they will. I mean, I don't... In terms of in terms of your opinion, do you think Dion Fortune is quite well known? Because I, personally, in the circles I roll around in, <laughs> um, I don't... I haven't really heard her name okay, that often. In, in Britain and in America, I'd say that she is quite a big deal. She's the most famous female occultist of the 20th century. Yeah. You know, people will put her alongside Crowley as the most famous and important occultist of the 20th century. Wonderful. Uh, certainly in this country, they do, and there are a lot of people in America as well. I mean, I could also mention, you know, the, the, the novel by Marion Zimmer Bradley, The mm. Mists of Avon, which was a huge, huge, huge success, um, which presents what you might call a feminist revisioning of the female characters in the Arthurian mythos. That is really very, very much based on a superstructure of the unfortunate ideas yeah. of, of Arthur Merlin, Morgan being initiatory titles, the whole thing going back to Atlantis. So that shows the level of inspiration and, that, and how far out it's reached. And there's no question here in Glastonbury that even to this day, decades later, there are a tremendous amount of ladies from the USA that cross the Atlantic uh, on the basis of uh, what's been presented in Mr. Babylon and, and the resonance around that, those ideas. And you know, more often than not, you know, they're aware of the Dean Fortune connection there. Well, that's wonderful. It's wonderful her work still lives on. So thank you, Paul. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. I uh, imagine you're I quite enjoy busy. It focuses me and it, it, you know, it, it vibes me up Great. when I can transmit this stuff out there and I know that I'm, you know, people that I may never meet in my old life on the other side of the world somewhere are going to be listening to what I've got to say and that maybe, um, you know, they might read uh, some of or all of my books and you just never know how far out those, those ripples go and it's great. It's wonderful. Um, so where can people buy your books and find more, out more about your work? Out there in New Zealand, um, there are no physical copies of any of my books, but they're all on Amazon Kindle. Yeah, very and good. They are all Amazon Kindle. In, in, um, in the UK, there's still physical copies of some of my books. I've done, I've done 10 books now. I sold out of all the initial print run of uh, A Cold Battle of Britain, at the moment, there's no plan to do any more of them, but I would like to think uh, that somewhere along the line, some more will materialise, but I've got, there's a little way to go before that and more books to come, so I'll say Kindle. Yeah, yeah very I'll, good. I'll say place to go. And, and yeah, you know, you can find uh, some of my material on this subject on, on YouTube lectures and so forth, as, as you've done yourself. Yep, and I'll add links to all of those sites. And you've got a website? I've got paulwestonglastonbury.com, yeah, uh, and that, you know, I, I, I don't put an awful lot on there, but you can connect up with me through my tours and communicate directly to me from it and so forth, and I'm easy enough to find uh, on Facebook where I've got, you know, myself as myself, I've also <laughs> got Paul Weston's Avalonia Neal publications uh, and pages for some of my other books as well. Fabulous. Thank oh, you so much. Great stuff, great stuff. Awesome. Really appreciate it. And I look and, forward and to I'm reading your quite, new book. Yeah, 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 I would say with a bit of luck, that'll be less than two months away. Maybe cool. sooner. Yeah, history and myth. Very good. Cool. Well, I shall let you go, Paul. Thank you very much. Okay, happy days to you all in New Zealand. Happy days to you in Glastonbury. Go well. And bye for now. Bye yeah. for now. That was amazing.
Thank you so much for listening and a massive thank you again to Paul for taking the time to talk to me. Um, it made me aware of how much more stuff I want to learn. I might have to, I think I've got to start reading all of, all of his books. There's all of Dion Fortune's books now that I've got to get through on top of wanting to read like all of Steiner's research and uh, lectures and books. Gosh, I could spend my whole life reading, but there's other things to do as well, like parenting my child and studying natural medicine and just kind of living in the world. You know, that's what Steiner always said, is that you shouldn't travel the path of esotericism or the occultism um, if it means that you take yourself out of the quote-unquote real world. And there's that balance is key kind of thing that um, I think is a bit of a blessing when it comes to parenting because your children keep you relatively grounded, feet on the earth, in the now, <laughs> when... If you're like me, you're prone to um, going into esoteric worlds that are very interesting but uh, can take you to places that aren't really necessary for uh, your development or helpful to the world. So I will have to temper my interest in all of these things with being a loving mama. Um, yeah so grateful for that and yeah hope you enjoyed it i really encourage you to look um up paul in all the places of the internet that you can find talks by him youtube uh itunes all those places just google his name or search for his name and it will come up with heaps of cool stuff honestly great stuff great stuff go download his book if you're a patron of the podcast you're in to win one of his ebooks this month the occult battle of britain great read great read but instead of me waffling on for ages i'm just going to say kaki te anō and i will talk to you again very soon go well <laughs>